Good evening. Welcome to tonight's event, Poetics Between Languages, the Turkish-German Experience, which is a poetry reading in conversation with Turkish-German Turkish -German poet Zafer Şenocak. I think I got that right. And his translator, Elizabeth Elkers Wright. And my name is Vivian Schmidt, and I'm the Jean Monnet Professor of International Relations and Director of the Center, sorry, Jean Monnet Professor of Inter, uh, of, what am I after all? <laughs> Jean Monnet Professor of European Integration and Director of the Center for International Relations here at Boston University. Tonight's event is the third in a series of conversations with European artists and writers being organized by the Institute for Human Sciences at Boston University in collaboration with the Center for International Relations and the literary journal Agni. Previous speakers at this series include German author Bernard Schlink and the filmmaker Agnes Valda, who is actually just here on Monday. Next Thursday, March 26, we're going to be welcoming the Romanian poet Liliana Ursu. Our Eurospective series is funded by the European Commission delegation in Washington, D.C. We're very grateful, needless to say, to the Commission for their support for this initiative. I would also like to thank all of our partners, Agni editors Sven Burkertz and Bill Pierce, the American Literary Translators Association and Zephyr Press, publisher of Zephyr's book, uh, which we actually have on sale tonight outside. Um, at what I understand is a bargain price. And I'd li also like to thank Dr. Chandler Rosenberger at the Department of International Relations and Elizabeth Amrian, our manager of the Institute for Human Sciences who makes much of this possible and work smoothly. Moderating tonight's event is Askold Melnichuk. Askold is former editor of Agni, which he founded in 1972 as an undergraduate at Antioch College. He is currently professor of creating, write, creative writing at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and a member of the core fiction faculty of the graduate Bennington Writing S Seminars. He has published stories, poems, translations in the literary journals and major in literary journals and major anthologies, as well as reviews in major newspapers. He's received a vast number of awards, including the L Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Award for Fiction in 1997 and the McGinnis Award in Fiction subsequently. His first novel, What is Told by Faber and Faber, was a New York Times notable book for 1994. His second novel, Ambassador of the Dead, which was Counterpoint Press, 2001, was called Exquisite and Original by the Washington Post. His third novel, The House of Widows, Grey Wolf Press, won the Editor's Choice Award for the American Library Association as one of the outstanding books of 2008. Askold Milnichuk previously taught at Harvard University and Boston University, where he edited Agni until its 30th anniversary year in 2002. A research associate of the Ukrainian Institute at Harvard he has served on the boards of the New England Poetry Club in Penn, New England, and has been a fellow of the Boston Foundation. In 2001, he received Penn American Center's Biennial Nora Majid Award for magazine editing, as well as Penn, New England's Friend to Writers Award. Askold himself will introduce our speakers, and without further ado, I hand it over to him. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, speak with you, to speak with um, our, our wonderful guests uh, this evening. Uh, what what um, I would like to do is just say a couple of words about um, translation and then introduce our um, guests and then begin a conversation that will go for about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to questions. Is that right? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I want to... Can you hear me if I speak like this? Yeah. Um, I, I want to bracket this conversation about translation between two um, misremembered New Yorker cartoons. The first um, shows three people, experts in their field, uh, being interviewed by a man who's asked them to identify uh, people who have profoundly influenced them. They're um, two men and one woman. Uh, the woman, a writer, says that her three primary influences were Virginia Woolf, George Eliot, and Anton Chekhov. 
the um, second person is a golfer. Uh, and he, of course, names uh, Arnold Palmer, Tiger Woods, and Chekhov. Uh, finally, uh, there is a physicist who rattles off his list. And it's, of course, Einstein, Newton, and you guessed it, Chekhov. So the importance of translation, anyone? Uh, juxtapose that against another uh, New Yorker cartoon, uh, which shows um, two women and a, a man tied to trees. Uh, in front of them stands a formally dressed, kind of primly dressed woman reading from a book, um, articulating uh, as though she were belting out an aria. And the caption reads, Americans enjoying literature and translation. Um, that's sort of the, the, the kind of cliched notion of um, the world of uh, the American attitudes toward translation. And it was uh, captured in a way um, uh, by the uh, Swedish academician Horace Engdahl when he uh, complained bitterly about the sort of self-involvement and uh, navel-gazing at popular culture that um, American uh, literature and letters uh, indulged in. Um, I, you know, I don't, that's certainly not the spirit that um, animates um, a place like Boston University. I remember uh, uh, when I taught here many years ago, there was a great translator in, in residence, then uh, William Arrowsmith. And uh, uh, some of you may know his uh, translations from the Italian or from the Greek. He was the editor of the Oxford uh, series of uh, uh, translations of Greek classics. He, um, he uh, once sent some translations of Montale to Agni, and uh, I had sent him back galleys with uh, the translator's name, as is kind of commonplace, uh, at the end of uh, the poems in small type. And he responded by writing back a passionate single-space letter in which he condemned this barbaric practice of reducing the translator to a trivial figure, because without a translator, the work would not exist. The translator was rather like the guru in Tibetan Buddhism, who is the equivalent of the Buddha himself, because he brings this work into being. And it's in the spirit of kind of co-authorship um, co in a way that I hope we will conduct our conversation with our two remarkable guests this evening. Um, one of them, uh, the, um, our, our, uh, the poet, um, novelist, uh, essayist, uh, Zafer Shenochak has been called the most important living voice of German multiculturalism. He was born in Ankara in 1961, moved to Munich with his parents in 1970, where he studied political science, philosophy, and literature. He started publishing books of poetry and essays in the 1980s in Munich, winning the Adelbart von Camiso Award uh, for literary prose given in, German, in Germany for foreign writers writing in German. He's also uh, published a substantial body of essays and political and social criticism that's really uh, remarkable, um, an atlas of, of a tropical Germany. Um, the essays, while written in the 80s and 90s, feel uh, as fresh as though they were written yesterday. And we hope to we, we, we'll get a chance to get an update on some of those ideas there, too. Um, he's also uh, uh, author of a. Um, tetralogy of novels, uh, one of which I've had a chance to read, uh, Perilous Kinship, and it's brilliantly funny and uh, wonderfully translated uh, by Tom Cheeseman. Uh, I look forward to seeing it on the shelves here before long. Um, and uh, Elizabeth Ulkers Wright, the translator, um, and, and we won't say co-author, but, but, but co-partner in producing and bringing these into being, um, has uh, published work in many journals. She received a National Endowment for the Arts Award for translating the work of Zafer. Um, she's uh, served as the um, German language editor for the uh, Grey Wolf um, New European Poetry uh, Anthology. And uh, along with Franz Wright, she co-translated um, a book of poems by the uh, Belarusian poet Baljin Amor. So without further ado, um, I want to just say one final thing um, about why I really deeply appreciate um, 
literature and translation because it brings in ways of seeing that the native language um, simply has, has not offered us. You know, there, there's a, I'm forever grateful to the Swiss philosopher and poet Hugo Ball uh, for his remarkably lucid definition of two difficult words, culture and intellect. Asked what is culture, Ball replied, interceding for the poorest and most humble among the people as if from them the noblest beings and the rich plenitude of heaven were to be born. Intellect, meanwhile, he described as nothing other than conscience applied to culture. On a similar plane um, is an observation such as this. Poetry is the view that language has of human beings. And that is Zafar Shenatax. And I thought that we might begin with um, Zafar and Elizabeth reading three poems, the first three poems from the book published by Zephyr Press, Door Languages. And we could do it from here mm -hmm. if the microphones are on. Yeah. <clears throat> and they are. Oh, the German first. German yeah. first. Okay. Yeah. Good evening, to everyone. Selbstportrait. Mein Lebensspruch ist keinen Spruch mehr wert. Er hält mich nicht auf Beinen. Ich wollte nicht fort. Könnte ich stehen, genügte mir ein Stehplatz. Ich brauche keinen Boden zum Liegen. Zum Schlafen lehne ich mich an einen anderen Menschen. Sollte ich auf keinen treffen, habe ich Platz genug. I don't need the floor to lay myself down. To sleep, I'll lean on a fellow human. If I don't meet one, I'll have room. Wetter leuchten. Ich bin am Fenster und sehe, wie die Blätter zurückkommen an den Baum. Treffe Vorbereitungen für meine eigene Rückkehr verirre mich im Wald. Flash. I'm at the window and see how the leaves come back to the trees. Prepare to return myself. Lose my way in the woods. Rat für die Wildnis. Gehst du zum Wald Vergiss nicht das Märchen. Es wird dich verstecken, wenn du kein Haus mehr findest. Wilderness Tip. If you go to the woods, don't forget the fairy tale. It will hide you when you can't find another house. <coughs> Zafir, you've written for the poem gives no answers. To a certain extent, it is a question, a structure unto itself, woven out of questions that have not been asked. Is there anything more you want to add to that? Well, um, when I started to write, um, poetry was the soil. I was going on it. And um, I was not, for example, absolutely not reflecting about uh, to write a novel or to write a story or I, I was searching for words somehow uh, I'm col I was collecting words um, and this was a work like um, you do in a dictionary a little bit but you don't have the dictionary at hand so you, you have it in somehow in your mind and you must see the words in a different way and um, this process of uh, looking on words in different ways uh, was the starting point of my writing. And, uh, and of course, this brings a lot of questions, uh, mm -hmm. uh, this type of writing and searching uh, way. And uh, I always had, um, in the beginning, uh, two languages somehow in my head. 
uh, because uh, I came as a child to Germany and my mother tongue was Turkish of course um, and uh, at home I was speaking Turkish with my parents my mother was teacher and she was uh, caring very much about it that I was uh, speaking um, uh, correct and, and good Turkish and uh, outside I had uh, absolutely no friends who were Turkish origin I had only German friends so I was speaking only German <laughs> and I had really I was really since two separated language worlds and uh, my head mirrored the situation a little bit mm -hmm. in the beginning. So uh, I was absolutely also not reflecting in which language I write. Uh, I, I, I listened to my inner voice, to the voice in the head, and the, this voice decided the language. And in the beginning I wrote in both languages, and um, after two, three years uh, I wrote only in German, and in the last 10 years, I am again writing in both languages. So this is a, a, a something which is um, really not managed by myself, by a decision. Mm -hmm. I'm just following uh, a trace. Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and poetry was influential for my prose writing. Um, influential in many ways. Uh, one way was uh, I learned to write short. <coughs> Uh, poetry is to concentrate things, you know, you must concentrate um, ideas, observations, um, even a story. And uh, this is one thing. And the other thing was when I started to write essays, um, it was just going away from Munich to Berlin in the late 80s. Uh, I tried to find a language um, uh, which was not only a philosophical language, mm -hmm. abstract, mm -hmm. but also somehow like a story language but an essay form. And for this also poetry was very influential for me. Well, b before we get um, that far in the journey, uh, you have a wonderful sentence in one of your essays where you say that every, uh, every human being carries a map around inside them and that is their childhood. And yeah. I, w I wonder if we can uh, kind of uh, go back uh, before that second language entered into the sort of mind stream and uh, uh, hear a little bit about what it was like growing up in Ankara, and then maybe a little bit of what led you uh, to, well, well, we'll get to that. Let's start yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's too, quite important for my writing. Um, this very early years in Ankara and Istanbul, I came to Istanbul when I was four, and so I have only very few memories to Ankara, but um, uh, I had a lot of family members there. Um, I will, I'm coming from a family which is a little bit uh, 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 a copy of the Turkish uh, basic situation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, from the mother's side, um, uh, it's a very uh, uh, secular, republican, modernist family. Uh, my mother, uh, uh, unfortunately, she died a few months ago. She was uh, born 23, the same year when the Turkish Republic was uh, founded. And she was uh, one of the first generation uh, teachers a woman who went out of the home uh, to the profession, to outside, active somehow in social issues, interested in many fields. And, um, and she was, of course, very interested also in, in natural sciences. And uh, she was uh, in mathematics, and she was in, also um, in uh, linguistics somehow. And, um, and my father. Uh, uh, was coming from a large family, from a big family from the eastern part of Turkey, uh, very close now uh, to Armenian border, was uh, Soviet Union at this time, uh, when he was born, 26, and he, he transported a more traditional uh, 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 way of uh, thinking to me, uh, based very much in Islamic mysticism, uh, uh, this is a way of uh, tradition which is not so much um, up to date, unfortunately, because we have this political Islam a lot on, on, on the stage, um, which is in fact not, uh, not even a political Islam, it's just uh, a, 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 a broken phase of something which was forgotten somehow, what we have now. And uh, this um, mystical um, experience of religion or spiritual, uh, which was very um, alive in Anatolia, 
in the still in the beginning of 20th century uh, uh, interested me very much I must say and so I had two very different types mm. of uh, sources uh, from my childhood I learned for example uh, to read the Arabic script which is absolutely not uh, the case for my generation. Nobody learns this more. And um, so um, I learned to read uh, old poets. This is why you're still in Ankara. Uh, this is this is this childhood. I mean, yeah, Istanbul, childhood. Istanbul. Yeah, childhood. Yeah, okay. childhood. Uh, and I, I listened to this music, which was connected mm. to this uh, Sufi poets. And... Uh, uh, which was, uh, this was the first impression, you know, you have an impression and you, you go to places and you have some, some picture in your head uh, and 30 years later you visit the same place and somehow this picture appears again, you know. You have, you have this is a kind of memory which is not abstract in the head but you have a, a, a relation, essential relationship to places and this is working in my ca case very much about, uh, uh, on this way of um, putting these things together music, um, words, uh, way of... Uh, and this was, of course, always somehow in conflict with the, uh, the very rationalist uh, part of my family. Which would be represented by your father? Uh, by my mother. <coughs> the rationalist, oh, right. rationalist, yeah. rationalist. Yeah, my mother. Uh, uh, bureaucrats and, you know, this type of people who are somehow uh, representing this new Turkey for example. Right. Uh, and um, uh, for them, for example, uh, uh, everything was constructed somehow in a, in a very much Descartian way, you know. Uh, you can explain everything. You can see how it is. You know how it is. And my father had all these questions. He never knew very concrete how it is. He was going around the things. Mm -hmm. And so um, I had a... This and he was a journalist. He was a journalist. He was a journalist. He published also a lot of uh, monographies about people who are forgotten from older centuries, poets and on, thinkers. On Turkish history. Turkish and, history, yeah. And, and, uh, and he was an expert on this old language, you know, on this Ottoman language and things like that. So uh -huh. I could have it from him somehow. So uh, uh, the funny thing is that in Germany I could so uh, be educated in these uh, <laughs> traditional things uh, better than I, I would live maybe in Turkey. Uh, there, those things were oppressed very long time, so yeah. it was uh, yeah. not fashionable to do this. You know, it was forgotten, it wa was over, and it was garbage somehow for for decades. Well, what was um, you know, the, 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 that's not the usual profile of the Gastarbeiter, you know, family, um, no. mother, school teacher, you know, father, yeah. journalist, and a mystic. Um, also, not the sort of usual. I, I, I uh, misspoke and, and thought of your mother as the mystic because that would be the more traditional breakdown here of yeah. the feminine and the. And, and uh, um, so, what was it that led them to leave Istanbul and, and then uh, go off to Munich? Uh, was it 1970? Is that it right? It was, uh, yeah, it was just 1970. And um, I think it was, on one side, it was adventure. On the other side, um, uh, my father. F felt uh, somehow suffocated in this modernist Turkey. Mm. This is, sounds funny because uh, we think modernity is you know, liberty and freedom and you have uh, possibilities. But if it comes to a, 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 a technique of modernity, it can turn in a very totalitarian way. You know, the technique of modernity, you must really uh, observe how it uh, works. And, and, um, you want to say something more about that? That's a nice phrase, the technique of modernity. The and of course, I think of the technical side of it. but No, not that, only. Yeah. It's how you construct it. Because you have the idea, and uh, uh, I think that the ideas uh, are s uh, very much separated, often separated from how they are constructed afterwards. You know, the ideas of modern enlightenment in the beginning it, it, it's very good I mean you have opportunity for people uh, and uh, f uh, somehow equality for people um, uh, all good ideas we defend we stay for mm -hmm. the values right uh, the values when of you the West, yes say, yes yeah. I will not even say values of the West I will say uh, values uh, which were somehow um, uh, developed uh, through the last centuries uh, to improve lives of people. Yes. In fact, everywhere, because you don't have an alternative. If you look, uh, is there a, a condition better 
made maybe out of other values i can see it so it's it's for me it's for everyone but uh, the question you never uh, stop to ask yourself how it's really realized and in turkey of course it was realized in the 2030s very totalitarian way you know uh, i mean there was a one party there was a, a leader which is still the big figure of mm -hmm. the turks <coughs> at uh, turk yeah. and of course he had all the great ideas but how it was uh, um, uh, excessively uh, put down to the earth uh, was in the a little bit in the spirit of the time of course you know this uh, so you're uh, saying that there was a destruction of um, traditional uh, ways of, of responding to the natural world and to the uh, I would say it differently I would say there was no possibility more to develop the tradition mm -hmm. uh, if, if you close the, the door totally to tradition, you cannot develop it more. So what happened is that tradition closed itself in small room, and around this you had this this new, this new talk, new speech of, of modernity. But uh, to bring to bring them in conflict, this is not happening now. This is why Turkey is now very interesting. It's uh, you know this 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 wall between this traditional uh, uh, construction and this this modernity. It came down. It's open now, and, and now it's there is a con there are always conflicts, but I think that those are creative conflicts. Could you give us an example of how that's happening right now? Um, I can give it example from literature. Mm. It happened, for example, in the work of Orhan Pamuk. You know very well. Sure. Exactly, this happened in this work. Uh, uh, what he did is that he is of course based on this on this uh, uh, soil of modernity. I mean, novel is a form of very expressive form of, of modern thinking, but he, 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 he cheered on the wall to this uh, uh, heritage, which is just there. You can close your eyes, but you can open your eyes, and when you see it, and you can smell it, and you can, you can feel it. Mm -hmm. And he, he opened it, and, and then he created suddenly a new world, which is absolutely not a new world, in fact. Uh, everything is, is uh, in the books. You mm -hmm. can find it, but mm -hmm. nobody was searching. So this is uh, this is a very living example how it mm -hmm. functions, mm -hmm. and you can transport this also in society and in other fields. So um, to get back to the tra then the transition, that it sounds as though um, your family went to Germany to seek its past. I mean, is the way you presented it. And Elizabeth, jump in here any time, and we'll. Yeah, uh, Germany is not a very special place to seek a past. <laughs> well, you, 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 you say a number of things about that. Uh, yeah. you, you, sometimes um, you, you've suggested that uh, those who um, uh, call themselves rootless have no opportunity then of having a voice inside their new home, but then you also say that how fortunate it is not to have to inherit the particular past that um, you wind up finding when you go to Germany. Yeah. But, this, but, but if you could just, yeah. This is a very central question in my work. I mean, um, first of all, very general question, what happens when you go to another country uh, to settle down? Yeah. Uh, and um, you have just another past, somehow. And uh, so you share the present, but you don't share the past. It's the majority of people. Uh, and so you can't start uh, to question the issue of the past. Because of those, the people there, they also don't share the same past. It's a fiction, I mean, it's a construction, the same past. But uh, somehow, and, and this construction was, for example, in Turkey, very strong, you know, very much um, uh, combined to the uh, war of independence uh, and the creation of the modern Turkey, very strong, uh, talk, strong uh, positions right. uh, in society and culture. And uh, in Germany, I grew up in a, in a situation where there was absolutely no talk about a about, uh, uh, strong creation ground. Of, there was a, 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 a negative talk about how it should be not be mm. Third Reich, Hitler, all those mm -hmm. things. And um, and now, uh, with the unified Germany, it changed a lot. And this is what I observe a little bit, and I try to write about it and to see it from, from different perspectives, what it means. 
one more question to you that I want to bring Elizabeth into yeah. this and talk about translation a bit. But you, you, you mentioned that people often ask you about your sort of family history and your personal past, yeah. but, but um, they don't ask you about the myths that form your past. And you've, uh, you mentioned in one of, the, one of your essays that you th uh, think the sort of myths of Europe are by now depleted, exhausted, they're rote, they're, they're just stories they don't, that, that don't compel. <coughs> And uh, you clearly have in the poems, and you've given us a brief glimpse of it by uh, mentioning the sort of Sufi mysticism, but you clearly have a foundation in a personally selected and gathered group of myths and ideas about um, sort of underlying structures. And I wonder if you could say something about that, the mm. myths that, 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 you know, I, I, when I was in Istanbul, um, I remember going to the Top Copy Palace and uh, seeing there um, in one room where an imam uh, spends 24 hours a day reading from the Quran because you've got the footprints of Muhammad there and the bones of John the Baptist. Um, in the next room, you've got the fluted ivory rod that Moses used to part the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. And you know, I realized again that you've got um, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the, and the Quran forming the mythic foundation there. Um, I wonder what you, what other sort of foundation there is, the uh, mythic foundation that you see there and what you see in Europe? Mm -hmm. um, I see a lot of connections, of course, um, because I don't have this in my, in my head that there is a border. Um, I don't believe that there is a border of Europe, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very complicated because uh, if you make a border for Europe, you have really to throw out the center of the European creation which starts in, in, in Greek, uh, in, in old antique Greece, and goes to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is very complicated. The center of Europe is not the center geographically of Europe of today. It's not Switzerland, Austria. It's, it's, it's just on, on the edge. That's the, this is the cultural contradiction of Europe. You know, it's all creation, all the Renaissance, everything is starting mm -hmm. from, from this border point. So in this, I see a lot of uh, touching points but the question of today is how we can uh, reveal or, or re recreate, regenerate mm -hmm. the, the touching points because it became fashionable to, to, to have uh, borders again, mm -hmm. or clear um, uh, construction they had, what, what is the border. And I think it comes from a very, very natural human uh, fear that uh, you lose something like your home. Mm -hmm. Uh, people defend their homes. Mm -hmm. That's all about Europe. They defend their homes, and they don't know how to defend their homes because uh, 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 this is how we live in the last decades, very fast, changing places, people coming in, you go out, you don't have more the center. And they transform their need for this home need to the idea of Europe, and this is very dangerous mm -hmm. because then you really rewrite the cultural history and you create something which is uh, which is mythical mm -hmm. but has nothing to do with the mythical background of your own mm -hmm. of your history mm -hmm. and this is um, of course plays a big role in my writing um, also out of personal reasons I mean if you make this travel from from Istanbul to Munich and then to Berlin you have just this geography in your insight mm -hmm. you have the geography of Balkans in your insight you have the geography uh, of Eastern European side, you have this uh, touching points, which are also very strong in Germany. You have mm -hmm. touching points in Bavaria, for example, uh, towards the south, mm -hmm. very strong from Italy, mm -hmm. touching points. And um, this is something which we must really recreate, regenerate, if you want really to come uh, forward with the idea of Europe, mm -hmm. I will mm -hmm. say. Great. Um, I, I want to bring uh, Elizabeth into the conversation, and, and uh, first again, also just um, in, in, in a um, straightforward way of asking how you and Zafer uh, got in touch, how you began to uh, translate him, and uh, something about the circumstances of your working together. Um, I was on a uh, fellowship year in Berlin in uh, 1994, the end of 94. And I was um, going to bookstores, um, going to readings, 
basically trying to find um, something I could connected with, and um, I found several authors, and one of them was uh, Zafar's work, um, and I just began translating a lot of his poetry. Um, and at a certain point, I worked up the nerve, and I wrote him a postcard, um, and uh, that was about, he was nice enough to answer, and, uh, and we, met and he was surprised to see that I had already translated quite a number of the poems. I, th I don't think um, he knew where I came from, um, what I was doing there, but that's how it started. Yeah. And uh, did you find that, w was he able to read your translations in, in English and, and comment on them or were you? Uh, um, at the time, uh, his English wasn't uh, advanced uh -huh. enough to read them, I think. Yeah. Um, but he had a translation that someone, uh, an, another translator had done. And um, I was able to tell him that mine was superior. So. <laughs> <laughs> a very satisfying moment. Yeah. Um, I, I she could tell me everything. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, 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 I propose that I want to read you a quote uh, from Alistair Reed about translators. Uh, he writes that um, translators require the self-effacing disposition of saints. And since a good translation is one in which a work appears to have been written and conceived in the language into which it is translated, good translators grow used to growing, going unrewarded and unnoticed, except by a sharp-nosed troop of Dunnish reviewers, we call them the translation police, who seem to spend their reading lives on the lookout for errors. Um, you know, he, he then later goes on to talk about, um, uh, Nabokov says that, you know, a bad novel is simply a, a, a blunder, but a bad translation is a crime. And, and uh, I wonder, first of all, what your own sort of um, philosophy of translation is, and then what your own experience has been in bringing works out <laughs> into the world. Well, Nabato Nabokov's translations were a crime. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I completely agree. <laughs> made Pushkin plod. Um, my theory of translation. Um, well, I, I'm uh, someone who who likes to read poetry, and I, you know, I, in English, and I like to be moved by poetry. Um, I was excited about poetry and translation when I when I first really started reading poetry, um, and I never knew whether that was just because of the, you know, the English was a little bit different, or I was excited by the the, um, the different writers from around the world, um, maybe a little bit of both. Um, so when I translate, I like to make a poem that is one that I would like to read in English. Um, I try to pay attention to the music of the poem. I try to pay attention to the way we say things in English. Um, the, em the emphasis we put on lines, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. for example. Um, mm -hmm. and, and have you um, been uh, um, uh, harassed by the translation police in your, uh, in your time, or have you been fairly safe? There's, there's always somebody, there's always a professor in the audience <laughs> who, who will find something to ask you about that you might have mistranslated. Um, and and uh, Zafar, I know that you also have translated yourself. In fact, I think you translated a novel by an early Turkish emigrant yeah. to Germany. Yeah. And yeah. I wonder if you could well, say no. something about that and that yeah. experience. I, I translated this novel for money. Uh, uh -huh. no, no. It can happen. I mean, uh, yeah. you also do something for money for this uh, issue. Uh, <laughs> it's not only artistic uh, issue. Uh, but I translated uh, by my heart uh, um, uh, and by <coughs> compassion um, the uh, poems of Yunus Emre, who was a mystical poet of 13th century. This is, uh, in fact, the only translation I made uh, uh -huh. from from Turkish to German. It was in the in the 80s, and I worked along about this text to find the sound uh, in German for this. It was a challenge. And uh, I think it uh, influenced a lot also my early poetry somehow, this work of translation, mm -hmm. searching for the sound in German. Uh, and um, well, that's, that's all. So I'm not, not a translator, in fact. Uh, 
in, in your in, in, in that one experience though were you looking uh, for um, a natural sounding German or were you uh, trying to sort of stay true to the original uh, this is um, you know this point was translated several times in the 19th century by orientalists some uh, of them translated by uh, uh, also they translated for example half his poems from Persian and the same thing what happens with Hafiz happened also with Yunus Emre. You read his poems and uh, they are full of pictures mm, mm, very much repeating themselves. The pictures are repeating themselves and they are very, um, we call it blooming in German. Flower, flowery, flowery, you can smell it, right. it's flowery. Uh, and when you know, you read the original, absolutely not. It's very clear, uh, sometimes very uh, even uh, banal language, you know, very very low level of emotion. And so I was. This was a. This was the main point. I was thinking, this is not. This is not the thing. I mean, this this, this poet is not speaking in this in this level of, of flower language. And and uh, so I tried to find in German this way of uh, naked. Mm -hmm direct language and then afterwards a lot of people were surprised because we had a clear picture of of mm -hmm. how an oriental poet has to write mm -hmm. and we're thinking is is this some someone asked is he is he from 20th century or from mm -hmm. so uh, even the times yeah, were sure. confused sure. so uh, uh, this was this was my <coughs> my aim so so the similar aesthetic well um, I was just thinking with what he was saying um, I was trying to present um, one of the translations that he did of a Eunice Emery um, poem to a class of Americans, and um, I wanted to find a translation into, of it into English that I could give them some idea of what the, the poem was like and then what he was doing in the German, since they, the class didn't know German. And um, I looked and looked and looked. I couldn't find any translations that... Um, not not only didn't move me, but it wasn't even close mm -hmm. to what I was reading in the German. So I ended up um, making a a trot from the German <laughs> translation, <laughs> uh -huh. um, which was which f felt even you know better than right. you know even as rough as it was, it right. felt better than some of the English translations. So right. Well, I, I wonder if we might just for a minute, then, um, since we've gotten into the kind of the the, the nuts and bolts of it, take a look at the um, one translation that I've um, handed out on, yeah, of an early is, poem. Yeah, this um, is from this time where I translated these poems exactly. Uh huh. So we yeah. can sort of see um, some of these same questions there, and and we have um, on on one side. I thought that we'd begin with uh, again the German, and then the final version, and then take a look back at some of the earlier versions that Elizabeth worked with in, in um, getting to this because we have just one chance to hear the sound right in a language and I want to hear about how you get to that final mm -hmm. version. Tierweisung Folgst du der Spur eines Vogels so glaube an das was du willst du wirst keinen Widerspruch hören in der Luft wird nicht sichtbar jung und alt heimisch und fremd, so glaube an das, was du willst. Beim Fliegen ist ein Vogel gläubig, doch auf dem Baum zweifelt er, im Käfig ist er verzweifelt. Animal Oracle Follow the trail of a bird. Believe in what you want. You won't hear one argument. In the air, nothing can be seen young and old, native and stranger, so believe in what you want. When flying, a bird believes. On the branch, he begins to doubt. In the cage, despair. There's a wonderful fluency and ease in that final version. And if we flip over um, the page, you've got um, several of the uh, earlier drafts mapped out along with um, notes that you made and and what's really interesting is to see how much of the poem came to you quickly and then the kind of minute changes that you wound up making and I wonder if you could speak a little bit about what you were sort of um, working toward in the original. You mean in the first draft? Um, or? Yeah, in the first draft yeah. and, and then sort of how you, how you knew that that first draft wasn't right and where you would go oh. from there. 
It, the way you just described what <clears throat> you you uh, what I was doing is actually um, a good way of describing the way um, I translate uh, Zoffer's poems in general because they they appear they they're deceptive they appear easy to translate in many ways um, and y and you can you know write out a first draft that that someone else might write out fairly similar draft. Um, but then the, the, the tricky part is in some of the nuances um, and the music of the lines, the emphasis. Um, so in this one, um, <clears throat> I, would, I was really just trying to, to get the words in, in, into English, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> what were your sort of touchstones in the, what is the prosody of the German? Excuse me. Um, well, it, in this case, I, I didn't really, I, I mean, I wouldn't say that I really followed the, the German. Um, I, I might go about it differently uh -huh. now. Same, yeah. yeah. But, um, but at the time, I went more by the, the way I felt the line, the way I heard the uh -huh. line. Um, <clears throat> what's, the, what's the difference between the, the way you? Well, I didn't. Um, I wasn't. I wasn't analyzing the German so much. Uh -huh. um, I was. I was. It was more intuitive, I would say. But I didn't like the third line of the first stanza. Um, it, it seemed overly prosaic, and it needed to, it needed to have a punch to me. It needed to well, and it also needed to be idiomatic. Uh, so that's why I was playing around with different ways of saying that, and it was difficult to to uh, to make that line fit the the, the rhythm and the, that I wanted. Um, so it was entirely, it was a rhythm that you heard for it. It was not as though you were trying to match the original beat for beat. No, no, no. Right. Uh, right. And, and then in uh, the um, penultimate version, there are small differences, uh, but in, in that last stanza, um, if we l look at the, uh, the final version, when flying a bird believes on the branch, he begins to doubt in the cage despair. And in that um, that ultimate version, you have a bird as a believer when it flies, but on the branch it begins to doubt in the cage despair. That that final one, the, the final version you came up with is so elegant, so neat. And I wonder again, what w w it was all sort of. Uh, what were the decisions you were making? Well, one one of the things that I one of the things that I I started to recognize um, once I got the the English down, and I, I went a little farther away maybe from, from the original. Um, when I went back to the original, I noticed, you know, some things that I wasn't going to get, but I, but I did notice that the, the last uh, words at the end of the last three lines of the poem um, were, were really important and, to the poem, and they were important to me to have them at the end of the line. I'm not, <clears throat> it's, it's not necessarily a practice of mine to reflect the syntax of the original uh -huh. um, or to bend the English in that way, but I did feel that this was, especially because it was a, a short poem, it was very condensed and it needed to, it needed to resonate, um, that that was key to the poem. So, um, it was really a matter of going, you know, getting away from a kind of a prosaic approach. Mm -hmm. um. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, thanks. Um, and so as, as you were uh, uh, reading these poems and translations, you were also um, developing your own sort of, your, your English, as, uh, which is for us now, Elizabeth was suggesting, as something that was a work in progress as these poems were being translated. Yes, but it was connected more to the visits in the United States in uh -huh. the 90s, because I, my, I mean, I write these poems, and as well as translating the poems, and I, in, in fact, I don't want to interfere there because, mm -hmm. um, as someone who also translated, I know that this is also kind of art, in fact. 
it's not a handcraft you know it's not nothing you, you can somehow right. teach really and uh, you can of course speak about it you can have a theory and things like that but uh, to hear a sound to, to bring it in another language and I think this between German and English it's very complicated uh, it looks in the first moment easier if you do it from Japanese to, f to French or something. Right. But I think it's not easier. It's may maybe even more complicated because it's, it sounds or it seems to be close. Mm. It's not. It's absolutely not close. And uh, um, the way to, f to, to see the language, the perspective on the words, different. It's very different. And, and this I understood with a little bit improving my English, which is still not very good, but uh, I could understand that... Uh, Oh, this is not about words. I mean, uh -huh. this is uh, how words uh, are uh, uh, placed right. uh, on, the, on the soil of language. It's very different, and you can brief it in a different way. Right. And um, so it's, for me, adventurous, interesting to read this text. Right. But those are translations. Those are translations of Elizabeth Urquhart's right, in my eyes. Right. So d different entities. Yes. Um, I want to s step back for a minute then from the sort of minutia, and we can return to that and open it up to questions in a few minutes. Um, but but uh, I, you in the 90s became um, a spokesman, uh, as I understand it, for a whole sort of a body of uh, a whole population <coughs> in Germany. Um, I'm sure that most of the audience is, acqu is acquainted with uh, the, the phenomenon of the guest workers um, in, in Germany. There were something like I th almost three million Turks right now in mm, Germany, yeah. and, and uh, um, you, in a way, became um, their uh, literary voice. Um, I don't know. I think I was not. I, I am not the type of uh, spokesman. Mm. I can. I cannot do this job. In fact, good. Um, and I think I was not a spokesman, but maybe I was the first who was speaking. <laughs> right. This is the difference. Sure. And uh, for my generation, I mean, I came uh, to Germany uh, 70, I was eight years old. And uh, I was, uh, for example, the only Turkish origin people in the school for a long time. And there were no ch children at this time. They all, the next generation grew up in the 80s, you know. Mm -hmm. So in my generation, there, are, there were only a few people, in fact. And um, this is a generation who, who, who assimilated itself very fast, mm -hmm. um, writing in this language, making politics in this language, and so on and so on. Um, so we had an experience. We had a special experience. And, um, but our number was not, not large. We were a really small group. Mm -hmm. So there was a, not a position of a spokesman for this group. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Uh, sure. No, but absolutely. but uh, there was a possibility to talk and to speak and right. to ask questions. And uh, um, it's important to say that uh, my theistic work and my questions started uh, around uh, 8990. And uh, this is, of course, an important uh, and calendar. I mean, this is, was the fall of the wall and uh, the, the unification of Germany. And mm -hmm and um, the German question and the question of the past and what it means a nation, uh, mm -hmm. what it means to be center of Europe, uh, unified Germany. Uh, I, I started to, to, to pose some questions about sure. it. Sure, and in speaking out of that experience, you know, you, you, it was a moment that, that you experienced in, in um, Germany, but I think that it was one that was alive in the United States in different ways, too. The whole kind of multicultural phenomenon was happening here without, um, a, sim without a similarly dramatic um, external marker. And and uh, and I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't mean to suggest that you were a spokesman for for anyone other than your own sort of spirit and experience. But but there is a way in which reading your essays, um, I find certain themes that you are striking repeatedly on behalf of others. And one of the themes is in fact the presence of the other in a, a largely homogeneous. Um, yeah. Entity, and uh, you, you you make a number of absolutely brilliant, wonderful points about the ways in which uh, we are forced uh, at the start of the 21st century, the close of the 20th century, to think about um, the other using uh, 19th century concepts like the nation and the people, and in in in, in some ways. Uh, 
it feels as though we have been further pushed into those since these essays were written. Um, there might be a slight uh, change happening now, I'm not sure, but I wonder if you might say something about the way um, you uh, brought the idea of the other into the conversation in Germany. Mm. And you, you, you know, anyway, I'll say more about that. I, I wish this essay were not so much up to date today. I must say. Yes. I mean, I'm appreciated because I was yes. writing these essays, but I don't. I'm not appreciated as a, as an observer of social development because uh, those are questions which uh, somehow should be overcome in, in an open society, in a modern society. But we are now going uh, in very different ways. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. this is very strange. It's a, like a labyrinth. Mm -hmm. You don't know. It's, uh, it's not a. It's, I mean, this linearity. I never believed in this linearity of history. You know, right. start somewhere and end somewhere. But uh, uh, you have circles. You have up and downs. And now we have a labyrinth, and we are searching this labyrinth. For, we don't even know where the door is and where starting and ending point is. Mm. And it's also very dif uh, difficult uh, 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 to meet someone in this labyrinth. You know, mm. you go just uh, in a different way. And this this is something which uh, combines a lot of people, I would say. Mm. Uh, this is not a condition only for, for the majority of people mm. living in a country with a history background and things like that, and the newcomers. But we, it combines them all. They are all in the labyrinth somehow. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is interests me, of course, as a writer. I try to bring this as form, for example, to novels. Mm -hmm. Um, so, a lot of, uh, not a lot of, but a few novels I wrote, um, they are, have not this linear construction of story, mm -hmm. but more like a labyrinth. They are constructed like a labyrinth, and they, uh, they are because they have uh, some parts which are missing, or you know, this is some in that labyrinth. Holes. What are we searching for? Uh, um, a house, a house. Uh, Germans say Heimat, this is a mm -hmm. very complicated term. Uh, but uh, the strange thing in Germany is that uh, you don't use this word so much. It sounds old-fashioned, uh, old mm -hmm. but it's still everywhere. You can feel it, you can smell it somehow. It's a notion. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a longing. Mm -hmm. And this longing, um, I think it's very important to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, for example, why Germany was neglecting so much this issue of immigration. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, for example, I don't believe that uh, there, there is something like German multiculturalism. Mm -hmm. There is nothing like this. I mean, there was nothing like this before and there's nothing like this now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but there is a conception of Heimat which is very, very strong in German tradition. And uh, maybe we need also translations for this big old words. Mm -hmm. I mean, you cannot translate this word in other language. It's very complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot say a homeland sure. or something. It's, uh, so you, you make it always profound in, a, in other language somehow. But uh, and this is go going, of course, back to German Romanticism and, and uh, the, the creation of, of the idea of Germanness, mm -hmm. uh, which is a cultural idea first. It's not an idea of borders or, or state or something like this. So idea of uh, Hegel started with this idea of state, and it was uh, not even bound so much on Germanness and uh, so the, the, uh, the idea of Germanness is really based on the romantic culture of Germany. And w one of the things that you observe is that it's um, nearly impossible uh, to speak to the other when you don't know the sorts of myths and, and yeah. when you don't have um, the knowledge that the other has uh, of you. For instance, you know, being a, a, a Turk in, in Turkish in Germany, you would uh, have learned German literature and the language, but very few of the people you were speaking with would have had a sense of your own Absolutely. history. And so right. that makes conversation tough. Very tough and uh, controversial sometimes. So it was a great source of misunderstandings, of course. Uh, in what way? Uh, well, I can give you an example. For example, this Turkish notion of nation, which is, was based a little bit on this French, not a little bit, real full of this French model mm. of citizenship, and uh, don't talk about origins, you know, forget them, and mm. be somehow assimilated in this uh, modern technique of nation mm. building. Mm -hmm. uh, this is very complicated to understand in Germany, because in Germany you have really this notion of uh, ethnical groups, people belong to some uh, 
background, ethical background. This is very foreign for Turks, for example. It's very complicated to, to discuss this issue. On the other hand, the way how Turks look on history, this is a, a heroic history. Turks were always good. They were doing very big things. They, um, uh, they created 16 states in history, and uh, they were emperors, uh, but always good to people. You know? And um, big civilization, everything. Oh, this is uh, put in a, in, a, in a frame, which is, if you look from, from a German perspective, it's absolutely, you cannot even have a conversation about it. And on the other hand, when Turks came with this picture of nation uh, building and, and, and self-understanding to Germany, we, we think, what kind of strange people are those? They don't like themselves, no? <coughs> I mean, there's a... Uh, you, you, you say that repeatedly, that there is in Germany yeah. a sense of um, self-loathing, that, that the people love the mountains, love the landscape, yeah. love the place, and yet do not love themselves. And what Now we, we try to overcome it. Yeah. It's, uh, but we try. I mean, we, it's not uh, something we, we you're born with. You know, you must you must work on it. You learn to. You must work on it. And I don't know if you can work on it really. I don't know. It it, it will because I mean this is really a country which offers a lot of possibilities also. Mm. You know, and also the the post-war German history. This is uh, unique, I would say, unique in the sense that you had such a destruction, moral, economical. <laughs> Im unimaginable destruction that you could recreate and then a country which is now one of the countries I would say where um, uh, life, a free life uh, in a relative uh, possibility for human, given for human is possible mm. in Germany and this is a long way to go in fact mm. not a short way to go um, uh, Elizabeth, I wonder if you might say something about how you know a concept like Heimat might be translated into American, um, partly yeah. because I, I, I um, uh, remember when I was in Berlin, I had I, I actually felt uh, a couple of years ago that it was a hopeful place, precisely because mm -hmm. it gave us as Americans um, a sense of possibility that out of the ashes this can come, the sense of the vitality and so mm -hmm. on. So I wonder what... Well, uh, my understanding of the word Heimat makes me, I mean, the images that come up for me, I don't think of words immediately in English. Um, hmm. I, I think of, uh, they, they, uh, there's a certain type of literature they called Heimat Literatur, which is really written in kind of a, a dialect, dialect mm. um, where it's written on the page in dialect. Mm -hmm. And mm. in some ways not really taken that seriously. Um, so, but loved. By many, and strongly, and passionately by by people. So, there, so I have this this sense of um, passion with Heimat, um, but also a little a little bit of. Um, well, it's interesting. In the, the I mean, the word Heim Heimat also was related in German to Geheim or secret. Um, so there's also this 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 sense of a little bit of the sense of almost shame with it. You know the home and secrets and everything surrounding home, things that you, <laughs> things that you love, um, but things that are are private that are yours. You know, so there is a sense of of possession, and a sense of we're not going to tell you. Mm -hmm. This is a so kind it's, of uh, how would you translate that? Yeah. <laughs> Homeland I Security. Mean, <laughs> <laughs> this is a modernization of it. <laughs> it's up to date. <laughs> this is a kind of group intimacy, you know, what you create with this word. I mean, mm -hmm. intimacy is a very mm -hmm. personal thing, in fact. But if you bring it to, to, towards other people, the, that you, kind, you create a kind of intimacy <laughs> for a larger uh, space, mm -hmm. uh, for somehow people connected somehow to each other. And this is, this is uh, I think, very, very important to understand. I, I don't know if this is right, but it makes me think a little bit about maybe Appalachia or, you know, mm -hmm. some, you know, very deep-rooted communities in, in this country. Um, sure. Yeah. And Berlin is absolutely not a place for Heimat, for example. Berlin is, for, for a lot of Germans, Berlin is a very foreign country. I mean, this is a very, this is, this is a construction. Berlin. Mm -hmm. This is also very important follow, to follow this, uh, this, this trace because uh, the idea of cosmopolitanism, for example, of this mixture of mm -hmm. cultures and people, which was really the, the creation soil of the modern Berlin in mm -hmm. the 20s, 
this is something which is very far away from from, from the ordinary good German city yeah. of middle shape, so 100 to 200,000 inhabitants, mostly with an old university. And so this yeah, is if the if other model. If if uh, if you meet someone, they say they're from Berlin. Mm. Unlike many other places mm. in Germany, you don't know anything about them really, f just from saying right. them saying that. Right. It could be anyone. Any, right, anything. right, right. The kind of a sense of cosmopolitanism that you'd have right. in any large city. Um, you know, in 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 one of your uh, perhaps it's an early essay now, and and this no longer applies. But you spoke about the kind of uh, the, the spirit of dejection that you have in Berlin, and it reminded me of that wonderful phrase that um, Oran Pamuk has uh, for the feeling that um, dominates um, Istanbul. Huzun. Yeah, 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 and, Huzun, yeah, and, and the melancholy of Istanbul. The, the melancholy, yeah. the melancholy yeah. of, of um, yeah. Istanbul. Yeah. And, and, and I, looking out the window this afternoon, when we were standing out there, um, yeah. I looked at Boston and felt the melancholy of Boston, indeed. And Absolutely right. I think every big city has this melancholy mm -hmm. somehow of its own. Hmm. It's, not a, it's not a special thing for a special place, no? And it's like, well, I was, I, I, of course, immediately associated with uh, yeah. the atmosphere of ruined empires. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether you would uh, characterize you mean it that way. Ruined empires? You mean yes. America as yes. ruined empires? Yeah. I think, uh, yes, of course, but not only, because uh, I think this is a real metropolitan issue. Because, uh, I mean, you don't really win uh, space in a metropolitan area, you lose space all the time in making a big city mm -hmm. but it's a it's about losing space in fact mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. uh, uh, and this is this is the source for me for this melancholia which is you can feel in every I mean to city. internalize more in a way yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. um Big question. Just to, uh, Hans Magnus Enzenberger uh, wrote that um, the the role of literature is to invent and manufacture historically new feelings and perceptions. Um, so, uh, does, does, and 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 of course, you know what he means. Uh, yes, but I will not comment as a writer. <laughs> this is a c comment uh, must come from a reader or from from someone. Uh -huh. You know. Mm -hmm. um, well, that may be a nice transition then to yeah. a, a couple more poems. Um, I was wondering if you would uh, um, read the opening section of Door Languages. Yeah, sure. It's the title poem of the book. And then we'll open up to questions. Türsprachen. Türen sagen nicht viel dem, der nichts verrät. Einmal führten die Bewohner einer Stadt, die es nicht mehr gibt, eine Türsprache ein. Geschlossene, offene, angelehnte, mit oder ohne Klinken, beschlüsselt, behakt, in unterschiedlichen Farben. Jede Tür hatte ihre eigene Bedeutung. Vor langer Zeit war das. Heute kommt es nicht so sehr auf die Tür an, sondern auf die Schlüssel, auf den, der die Schlüssel in der Hand hält, auf den Moment der Ankunft. Wer bringt die Geduld auf, eine neue Türsprache zu lernen? Es gibt mehr Sprachen, als es Menschen gibt. Man hat die Schlüssel in der Tasche, den Code im Kopf. Notfalls tritt man die Tür ein. Door languages. Doors don't say much to those who disclose nothing. Once the inhabitants of a city that no longer exists introduced a door language, closed, open, left ajar, with or without latch, locked, peck locked, in different colors. Each door had its own meaning. That was long ago. Today it doesn't rest so much on the door, but on the keys on the one whose hand holds the keys at the moment of arrival. Who can find the patience to learn a new door language? There are more languages than people. The keys are in the pocket, the code in the mind. If necessary, the door is kicked open.
And I wonder if you could also read the third section there too. Third one. Alles ist anders gekommen, als ich dachte. Morgen gehe ich ins Amt, um meinen Leichenschein abzuholen. Ich werde mich von einer Hälfte meines Körpers trennen. Ich werde meine Adresse aufgeben und auf Reisen gehen. Dann repräsentiert mich nur noch mein Kopf. Er allein ist für Vertragsbrüche zuständig. Er bestimmt die Richtung. Man kann es sich niemals ausrechnen, wie es kommt. Es kommt plötzlich wie ein vom Dach stürzender Ziegelstein. Es überkommt einen wie ein grundloses Gefühl. Plötzlich ist man allein mit seinem Foto. Plötzlich wächst einem das Foto über den Kopf. Plötzlich verhängt einem das Foto das Gesicht. Dann auf einmal brennt es, die Haare brennen, die Wimpern brennen, Tränen löschen das Feuer nur notdürftig. Es bleiben die Augen übrig, sie lächeln ohne Gesicht. Eine unerwartete Person kommt und fordert ihren Teil und es ist nichts weiter zu haben als ein paar Augen, unter allen Geschäften das Schwierigste zu verhandeln über die letzten Körperteile, über die abgefallenen Hände, die verstummte Zunge, die versenkten Haare, das verschwundene Glied. Während die Augen sich weiten, größer und größer werden, stellt sich Gewissheit ein, dass der Kopf das Sterben niemals begreifen wird. Everything has turned out differently than I thought. <clears throat> Tomorrow I go to an office to pick up my corpse certificate. I'm going to separate from half of my body. I'm going to give up my address and go on a trip. Then I'll be represented only by my head. It alone is responsible for breaks in the contract. It determines the direction. You can never tell how it's going to happen. It all happens suddenly. A tile falls from a roof. A feeling strikes from out of nowhere. Suddenly, you're alone with your photo. Suddenly, the photo grows over your head. Suddenly, the photo drapes over your face. Then all at once, it burns. Your hair burns. Your eyelashes burn. Your tears only put out the fire temporarily. Your eyes are left over and smile facelessly. An unexpected person comes and demands their part, and there's nothing left to have but a pair of eyes. Out of all businesses, the most difficult is bargaining over the final body parts, over the dangling hands, the dumb tongue, the singed hair, the vanishing member. While the eyes keep getting bigger and bigger, a conviction comes over you. The head is never going to grasp death. That looks like an especially challenging poem to translate. Is there anything that you write about it very wonderfully in your introduction, and and uh, it made me uh, want to ask how much um, you and Zafir uh, discuss sort of the meaning of poems as your <laughs> in what way you talk about them. Um, we don't really discuss the meaning of the poems. I would say. Mm -hmm. um, what what we have done, um, sometimes I'll come up with a list of questions, but they're usually more technical questions or things that I just don't understand. Um, and then sometimes he'll go through the, the poems just to see if there's something that I've misunderstood or... Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of you know the overall meaning, sometimes for me it's it's not something I completely understand until years later, so... <laughs> Um. Yeah. Um, okay, finally, before opening up to questions, I just have one last, uh, I've got you many more questions for you, but one sort of, uh, one before you bring the audience in is, um, it must be uh, uh, doubly complicated for you to uh, put together um, not only sort of a language for yourself, but an anthology of poems and writers for yourself. And I wonder if you might, um, say something about who uh, who would abide in that sort of anthology of half a dozen poets uh, who speak 
who and continue to speak to you. For instance, I was surprised to see nowhere in um, your work any mention of Nazim Hikmet, who is the one sort of Turkish writer that's best known here. Mm. Of course, I know poetry of Nazim Hikmet, but he was maybe not so influential yeah. on my work. Um, I don't know. Uh, I have, of course, poets I read uh, several times, very um, intense, and uh, especially in the years when I started to write these poems uh, in the um, late 70s, early 80s. Um, and uh, they were very different type of poets, in fact. Uh, uh, this was, for example, Lorca from Spain, which was sure. um, impressing me a lot. This is, I read it in Turkish translation, I read it in a German translation, in French translation. And um, of, uh, unfortunately, I cannot read uh, Spain, Spanish. Uh, but there were also, as I mentioned, these old poets mm -hmm. from the Middle Ages. And there was um, uh, Baudelaire all the time around um, for my writing, very important. But uh, this is really nothing special. I mean, you can ask uh, any poet and sure. he will give you uh, some names. And uh, there is maybe one poet which is um, now uh, has a lot of academic uh, uh, research uh, going on his text, which he was absolutely... Um, an outsider poet in these times when I discovered him, this was Paul Celan. Sure. And uh, the, the, the interesting thing is Paul Celan was for me that I read for the first time his poems, most of the early poems were impressing me very much, um, absolutely without knowledge of his Jewish background. Mm. I read it very early, and uh, I, I yeah, and uh, then I discovered this. Uh, it was interesting me, of course, very much. And uh, the same thing happened uh, to me with Franz Kafka. Mm -hmm. I read it uh, when I was 12, 13, and uh, like children books. And I think they work very good as children books. In fact, a lot of uh, Kafka pieces. Mm -hmm. And uh, and. Sure. Yeah, so uh, this From is... From a country that likes sh sh to give its children Strudel. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is nothing, yeah. This is nothing. So, uh, uh, and uh, this is uh, maybe important to say, um, of course, there is a very rich and um, interesting modern Turkish poetry, which is really not only uh, uh, understood if you read Nazim Hikmet, because there is, for example, a, a generation of poets born in the 20s, 30s, the so-called second uh, renewing or generation or second new generation, Kinjiene. Uh, and uh, I think my poems are very close to them, in fact. Uh, they have a, a little bit of dark but clear language at the same time. And uh, they adopted uh, some surrealistic motifs, but they are not followers of the surrealists. Mm -hmm. So, if, which they, it's a recreation of modernity in poetry somehow. It's not um, uh, uh, um, so artificial like uh, you work only with the language, mm -hmm. but it's not that naive that you think that <coughs> pictures are pictures. Right. So this is what interests me and what gives me a basic for my writing in poetry. But when I write the poems, it doesn't interest me at all. Great. Um, the, the, let's open it up to some questions from the floor. I've got a, uh, a bunch more if you don't, but let's uh, give people a chance. There's, there's a microphone over there, I think. Yeah, Tom? Yeah. Great. Um, okay. Th first of all, thanks for a great reading and, and discussion. Uh, a lot of the things that you uh, I'll bring up, came together as I was uh, listening to it. I, I know that uh, I remember Derek Walcott at one point saying, you know, one of the jobs of poetry is perhaps to rename the known. And then I uh, have found one of the other jobs of poetry perhaps, and they don't necessarily contradict each other, is to make language be what isn't, he said modestly, but you know. <laughs> um, and I'm and I'm. Th I thought that Elizabeth's translations were terrific, and I like that criteria. The, the the first yardstick being, you know, is is this a poem in English that I would like to read? Um, and you mentioned language, this search of a, through the labyrinth for a home, and I, I'm wondering if translations work as as a kind of a, a, an exploration or visitation, or if possibly the the uh, the the creation of of a new imagined home. 
Um, and thank you again for a great reading. Yes, great question. Yeah. I have to think about that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're ready off the mark. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can follow this very well. I mean, this is where I, I like to remark. Yeah. yeah. It's not a question if it's a remark. It's, yeah, oh, it is. Yeah. It is. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I sign. I understand it. <laughs> hey, maybe I don't know. The the poetry. I mean, this is very interesting because. People say uh, uh, poetry, you cannot translate poetry. There's some a kind of standpoint sure. like this. Sure. On the other hand, uh, if you meet people who read poetry, like poetry, who read poetry really in all those translations from all over the world, this is the, the form which is really functioning and is a, is a, is a, is a network of, of languages and over translations. This is. This is the idea of, of, of a creation of a new home, in fact, and, yeah, as a net. In the Poetry is what survives translations. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Yeah, Elizabeth? Oh, no, it's a OK. Next one, yes. Um, I, I wanted to thank you, first off, for a wonderful reading. Uh, uh, they're really remarkable poems, and I really enjoyed hearing them, and, and also in, in the remarkable translations. Um, I wanted to ask you about your new experience now of uh, returning to writing in Turkish, because I have to say that listening to your poems, um, it, it, I'm, I'm glad you brought up Paul Celan, because of course Paul Celan was you know, not only this phenomenally accomplished poet in, in the German language, but was also an immigrant to that culture, coming from a Romanian village, uh, uh, you know, sort of, I think you have a kinship with him in an interesting, in an interesting way. And I'm wondering, because so much of your poetry and so many of the images you were using to describe your youth and your experiences come, it seems, very much out of the German tradition you know, your talk about the, the technique of modernity, you know, has that echo of Heidegger in it, mm -hmm. the techne. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if in returning to writing in Turkish, you're discovering imagery and language um, that uh, doesn't come out of that German tradition. And if you are, you know, reimagining not a Heimat, because Heimat is such a German term, but reimagining a different kind of home that in images that come from the Turkish. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, I would not say that I return because I still, of course, write in German. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going on. Uh, sometimes I write also Turkish, and I, because I have this this voice, this language voice in me, and um, I don't want to translate it. It's not functioning. This this translator inside is not living. I don't believe in it that you have this translator in your head. You have really, you have really your world in this German uh, constructed poetry world, and you have this Turkish world, mm -hmm. which is smaller, of course. Yes, but I wrote, for example, two novels on Turkish directly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, in poetry, I must more based in German. You are full right. Mm -hmm. I published only a very small volume of poems uh, around further poems, a small volume of Turkish until now. But I have a lot of volumes in German, so this is you can compare it. It's but it's still there, and I don't want that. Uh, if it's there, it's there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like this. It's not constructed. It's not made. Uh, from time to time, I have some ideas in this, and I I can see that I cannot develop my poetry in Turkish like I developed it in Germany. Mm. I I can see it because I am also reading Turkish contemporary poets. And uh, this is the job I do there. This is not the same as we do. So I, I, I'm, it's more for me, maybe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And novels, it's different because uh, I, I entered a world. Uh, one of these novels is now translated into German. Uh, we will publish it in the next two months, uh, it's translated, and the other one will come up next year. And so all the German uh, audience can read it. But uh, it was necessary for me to go in this language for the stuff mm -hmm. I wrote. So very different uh, issue. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you, Bill. I, I have a question for each of you, and I think I'll just ask them both at once, um, and then sit down. <laughs> um, one thing I think that's interesting for us to consider in all of these events, with uh, 
European writers and their translators is, is the question of um, what kind of cultural translation goes on when you, when you translate these poems. And I think in, in this case, <coughs> excuse me, in this case, the, the question is particularly complicated because, um, because of the Turkish side of these poems. So I'm wondering, have you um, either yourself found echoes of something that you had to look elsewhere to learn about, you know, echoes of, of traditions that you, that you didn't understand and therefore went to Turkish sources? Or have you found that when Zafer um, tells you you haven't understood something, is, is there sometimes um, an echo of the Turkish, perhaps, that, uh, that is what made you misread the German in those cases? Um, thanks for the question. Um, I, I think that there are, there have been um, details, you know, there are some that I, I remember. Um, one, he pointed out that uh, 33 is an important number um, and that uh, 33 in Islam is, is the, the age you are in paradise, for example. So it made a big difference in the line. Um, it didn't necessarily make a big difference in the way I translated the line in that case, but it it made me understand more of that whole poem. Um, and I, that's similar um, with looking looking into uh, images from the Quran, from traditional uh, stories, things like that. But you know, I, I the, his influences are so varied. Um, it also goes to American literature, um, so it's not certainly not strictly, um, you know, located in 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 the place you know the places he grew up either. Um, so that that's something that um, I was constantly searching for at the beginning, and you know, on on one hand, I was looking at, at one point to uh, modernist Russian literature. There was you know, so there were there were a lot of um, a lot of points, you know, where I where I could branch off in, into uh, related um, literatures, related traditions, um, to get insight into the poems. So. Fascinating answer. Yeah. Um, th the other questions. Oh, Can I add something? Yeah, yeah. For example, if you read uh, long poems by Heleknikov, Vladimir Heleknikov. Sure. Yeah, you can you can find a lot of symbols from from Islamic mysticism and and and, and this touching issues, Asian uh, fantasy and all those things in this language. Uh, I mean, he was creating this stars language and things like that. But uh, so I think this is a, this is exactly the point that you have this somehow this these images, but they transform themselves in poetry. We should transform ourselves. It's something new. It's not like in an encyclopedia you open and you see, oh, okay, this is like. It, transform, it's a, a way of transformation, the language of trans uh, transforming them to the same uh, about German Romanticism. Of course, there are a lot of uh, uh, resonances or, or voices coming from this part, but we transform, we should transform themselves somehow. And, uh, but the question is interesting because, of course, uh, for example, when people in, in Iran or Turkey or in Arabic countries read Western poetry, it's very clear that they knew what it is. Uh, it's important to know the background. And, and the other way, it makes all the problems. You know, I don't know. Is it something different? Is it something? This is also a very interesting perspective issue we have in all those discussions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, did you have? So, yeah, yeah. My, my other question was it's a very different kind of question. But um, Zafer, when you mentioned that you're um, that that people who live in Berlin don't have Heimat, that it's not a place for Heimat, I wondered how how your father, um, you know, having gone to Germany specifically because the, the maybe the Turkish equivalent of Heimat was dying for him in in Turkey. Um, did he or does he find something that resonates in Germany with what he was looking for 
specifically in in uh, in leaving Turkey. Ja, Ordnung. <laughs> the fantasy of Ordnung. Uh, <laughs> it's not functioning more yeah, for everyone who wants to come. I will see. Uh, yeah, I, I, this was very typical Turkish perspective on Germany. You know, uh, this uh, that something functions and uh, you don't even feel that it functions. And um, this was very. Um, strongly represented, I would say, this idea in Munich, much more than Berlin, it's not like this. Uh, but uh, the southern Germany is like this, construct like this. And uh, I think for him it was, yeah, for him it was good somehow. He could uh, somehow develop his type of thinking better in such a system and in this very chaotic Turkey, which is uh, uh, only uh, staying on, 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 on uh, somehow written fundaments, you know, it's, it's the, the rule is written, it's never exercised, so. <laughs> I wonder if we might just close on, oh, one more question, yes, sure. Uh, you spoke at the beginning about the role that your father and your mother played for you, especially their study of the mystic tradition of Islam religion and Islam liter uh, literature. I want to ask if you think that this mystic tradition plays a role for your poem writing. And I want to ask you, Elizabeth, if you sometimes have to study this mystic tradition for to be able to translate his poems. And furthermore, I would like to ask if this mystic tradition plays any role within the Turkish communities in Germany. And furthermore, I would like to ask if you are really sure that the mystic tradition is not interesting for a broader audience in Germany. I remember the lectures of Anne-Marie Schimmel about Hafiz, about mystic dance, about this mystic tradition which were crowded and full. Anne-Marie Schimmel was the second women professor of Harvard the second, in 1965. Uh, these are my three questions. Do you want to start? Um, uh, about studying the mystic traditions. Oh, oh. I, I actually um, had an interest in that um, before I came to, to Zafar's uh, poetry. Um, and so I was excited to find out that he had translated um, the Turkish Sufi poet. Um, it's something that I, I was already interested in, but I, I would also say that I don't necessarily think it was necessary for me to, um, to study it in any formal way um, in order to translate his poetry, um, but it may have, it may have uh, been an affinity with the poetry and with the rhythms that existed already that, that drew me to the poetry, I would say, more so. Mm. There is a very long tradition, a deep tradition of German interest in this Islamic mysticism, of course. It goes back to, the, to Goethe, in fact, at least. This uh, spirit of the Sosiche Divan is very much influenced by this picture of the uh, wisdom, of mystical wisdom, you know, this type of rent, rent, which means uh, which you, can't trans you know, cannot really translate, but it's, uh, this rent, the figure of rent is typical, it's coming from Persia, this uh, idea. Th this is, in fact, nothing else as the, the best description of Goethe's personality. Jemand in der Schwebe, someone who is not fixed on, on one point, is always searching and, and, and always this. this and, and, and then if you read in the notes to the, to the, to the Divan, you can find a lot of um, explanations for why it was so interesting for him, the Goethe and half is this relationship. So it has a very long tradition. And um, uh, this is, in fact, a very um, uh, academic issue. Uh, what I criticize or what I was very 
unhappy with were, were the translations. The translations were not fitting to the originals. That is, uh, this is, uh, you can also find in Goethe's Noten Abhandlung. He's absolutely not happy with the translations of Hammer, for example. Mm -hmm. He and the interesting thing is Goethe cannot understand Persian. He can he don't know, know the language, but he knows that those <laughs> translations are not good. This is not obvious, and he's right. He is right. This is an interesting thing. He is right, and and the Westerstige Divan is the best translation made in German from from an Oriental language. It's not a translation; it's poetry, but it's better than all other translations. You can learn much more from this poem, poems about the spread of the um, so-called Oriental or mystical Islamic poetry than from the other translations. This was what I was mentioning. But the interest is big and large, and uh, long history and. Uh, um, uh, of, 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 of scholarship, uh, research. I uh, uh, admire very much, for example, the big book uh, written by Anamir Shimel, Mystical Dimensions of Islam. It's a great work. And I absolutely don't like her translations. <laughs> this is uh, really, this is based very much in this tradition of Rückert in the 19th century. And this is what I mean with this flower language. This is not the original. It's the, f um, the uh, interesting that this generation was really searching something in this East, and they, they somehow transformed the text to the picture we have in mind. And it's not, it's not, um, a, uh, it's not um, uh, transforming this uh, this the atmosphere of torches. This is the difference, maybe. And uh, mystical uh, poetry or mystical way of thinking is always, there is something also in Germany, of course, and uh, uh, unfortunately, this is now a very large subject. We have no time, I would say, mm. to, to yeah. deepen this, but uh, like uh, many parts of Islamic culture, it uh, transformed uh, itself also to a technique. Sure. It, uh, it lost its spirit. And so it's not giving this um, energy like uh, in the history. Uh, but uh, it's important to starting point to, to reflect about these traditions, what it means, uh, what it can be. And uh, because it touches aesthetics, it touches a spiritual uh, thought. And so it creates a very different energy, a different way of thinking when you have this uh, only this theological talks about religion uh, mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, instrumentalization of course of religion and politics so uh, there is a, a basic for this in, in this islamic um, cultures still to discover and to develop <laughs> and um, uh, it's de developing the, uh, discovering the own history in fact it's not mm -hmm. nothing adopting from outside uh, and uh, Maybe a very small remark to make it a more uh, the picture. Uh, years after I made this translation, late 90s, I discovered a translation by Franz Rosenzweig, um, a Jewish uh, German writer, thinker, philosopher, translator, who translated uh, the poems of Yehuda Halevi from Middle Ages Spain, Jewish Spain. And I was struck by the similarity of so many lines between this Yehuda Halevi and Yunus Emre, that it was really, uh, uh, this is still something which, is, uh, which I'm busy with and I want to write something about it, but uh, you can see how uh, in these times, I mean, this was Anatolian Sufism, uh, contemporary of Rumi, a poet you know very well here in the United States, uh, contemporary, and the other one, um, uh, mainly at the same time, a little bit earlier, but in Spain, 4,000 kilometers away. And uh, so there was a kind of, of neighborship and sure. exchange and language and spiritual and uh, aesthetic feeling of the world in these times. And uh, the way Rosenzweig worked uh, on these translations was very similar to my way to work. And I didn't know him before. I, did, I, knew, I knew Rosenzweig, but I didn't know this, this work, this translation. So uh, this is uh, maybe a, a controversy about translation itself. Why don't we have uh, let um, poetry and uh, uh, great translation have the last word then. If we could just close with some um, reading yeah. of uh, in, the new in the New World. Which page is this? Uh, 87.
Oh, this long one? Yeah, I'm the, just the first section. First section. Okay. In der neuen Welt. Man nennt mich Victor. Geboren bin ich auf einem Friedhof. Das erste, was ich von der Welt sah, waren Grabsteine. Vielleicht habe ich es mir deshalb zur Gewohnheit gemacht, in weißen Hosen durch schmutzige Städte zu laufen, stundenlang auf den öligen Sitzen überfüllter Busse zu sitzen und auf diesen langen Fahrten durch die Stadt in fremde Körper einzubrechen, die Verlassen von ihren Bewohnern fortwährend an ihre Einsamkeit zehren. Sie und die Zeit jagen sich gegenseitig. Wer, wen, wann hat und wie lange entscheidet allein die Vorsehung. Die untreue, lüsterne, kokette Rosenöl duftende Gefährten der Stadt, die vergilbte Landkarte in der Tour der Großmutter. Es ist der Staumbaum dieser Stadt, an den jetzt uralte Männer urinieren, eine Reihe uralter Männer, eine Kompanie entlang des Grabens aufgereiht, an den Schultern die Gewehrkolben. Gerade hatte einer ein Bordell verlassen, die rote Einöde, wo er sich zum, beim Zuschauen einen herunterholte. Er hat ein runstiges Gesicht und einen an den Sitzen vergilbten Schnurrbart. Die Augen sind schwach im Tageslicht, doch die eines Adlers in der Finsternis. They call me Victor. I was born in a graveyard. The first I saw of this world was a row of gravestones. Maybe that's why I've made it a habit to walk filthy cities in white trousers, to sit on oily seats in crowded buses for hours, and on city long rides to break into strangers' bodies, who, abandoned by their occupants, gnaw incessantly on their loneliness. They, in the hours, chase each other in circles, Who has whom, when, and for how long is solely decided by fate, the faithless coquette, the lewd, rose-oiled consort of the city, the yellowed map in the grandmother's trunk. Ancient men piss on the family tree of this city. A row of ancient men, a company lined along the graves, rifle butts on their shoulders. One soldier is leaving a whorehouse, the red wasteland where he shot his load while watching. His face is shriveled and his mustache yellowed at the tips. His eyes are weak in the day and eagles in the dark. Safer, Elizabeth, thank you very much for a wonderful conversation and reading. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.